Section 11 of The New Life, La Vita Nuova. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Mary J. The New Life, La Vita Nuova by Dante Alighieri. Translated by Dante Gabriel Rossetti. Section 11. But against this adversary of reason there rose up in me on a certain day, about the ninth hour, a strong visible fantasy, wherein I seemed to behold the most gracious Beatrice, habited in that crimson raiment which she had worn when I had first beheld her. Also she appeared to me of the same tender age as then, whereupon I fell into a deep thought of her, and my memory ran back, according to the order of time, unto all those matters in the which she had borne a part, and my heart began painfully to repent of the desire by which it had so basely let itself be possessed during so many days, contrary to the constancy of reason. And then, this evil desire being quite gone from me, all my thoughts turned again unto their excellent Beatrice. And I say most truly that from that hour I thought constantly of her, with the whole humbled and ashamed heart, the which became often manifest in sighs, that had among them the name of that most gracious creature, and how she departed from us. Also it would come to pass very often, through the bitter anguish of some one thought, that I forgot both it and myself, and where I was. By this increase of sighs, my weeping, which before had been somewhat lessened, increased in like manner so that mine eyes seemed to long only for tears and to cherish them, and came at last to be circled about with red, as though they had suffered martyrdom. Neither were they able to look again upon the beauty of any face that might again bring them to shame and evil, from which things it will appear that they were fitly guerdoned for their unsteadfastness. Wherefore I, wishing that mine atonement of all such evil desires and vain temptations should be certified and made manifest, beyond all doubts which might have been suggested by the rhymes aforewritten, proposed to write a sonnet wherein I should express this purport. And then I wrote, Woe's me. I said, Woe's me, because I was ashamed of the trifling of mine eyes. This sonnet I do not divide, since its purport is manifest enough. Woe's me, by dint of all these sighs that come forth of my heart, its endless grief to prove, mine eyes are conquered, so that even to move their lids for greeting is grown troublesome. They wept so long that now they are grief's home, and count their tears all laughter far above. They wept till they are circled now by love, with a red circle in sign of martyrdom. These musings, and the sighs they bring from me, are grown at last so constant and so sore, that love swoons in my spirit with faint breath, hearing in those sad sounds continually the most sweet name that my dead lady bore, with many grievous words touching her death. About this time it happened that a great number of persons undertook a pilgrimage to the end that they might behold that blessed portraiture bequeathed unto us by our Lord Jesus Christ as the image of his beautiful countenance, upon which countenance my dear lady now looketh continually. And certain among these pilgrims, who seemed very thoughtful, passed by a path which is well nigh in the midst of the city where my most gracious lady was born and abode and at last died. Then I, beholding them, said within myself, These pilgrims seem to come from very far, and I think they cannot have heard speak of this lady, or know anything concerning her. Their thoughts are not of her, but of other things. It may be of their friends who are not far distant, and whom we in our turn know not. And I went on to say, I know that if they were of a country near unto us, they would in some wise seem disturbed passing through this city which is so full of grief. And I said also, If I could speak with them a space, I am certain that I should make them weep before they went forth of this city." for those things that they would hear from me must needs beget weeping in any. And when the last of them had gone by me, I bethought me to write a sonnet, showing forth mine inward speech, and that it might seem the more pitiful. I made as though I had spoken it indeed unto them. And I wrote this sonnet, which beginneth, Ye pilgrim folk. I made use of the word pilgrim for its general signification, for pilgrim may be understood in two senses, one general and one special. General, so far as any man may be called a pilgrim who leaveth the place of his birth, whereas, more narrowly speaking, he only is a pilgrim who goeth towards or fords the house of St. James. For there are three separate dominions proper unto those who undertake journeys to the glory of God. They are called palmers who go beyond the seas eastward, whence often they bring palm branches. And pilgrims, as I have said, are they who journey unto the holy house of Galicia, seeing that no other apostle was buried so far from his birthplace as was the blessed St. James. And there is a third sort who are called roamers, in that they go whither these whom I have called pilgrims went, which is to say, unto Rome. This sonnet is not divided, because its own words sufficiently declare it. Ye pilgrim folk, advancing pensively, 
as if in thought of distant things, I pray, is your own land indeed so far away, as by your aspect it would seem to be, that this our heavy sorrow leaves you free, though passing through the mournful town midway, like unto men that understand to-day nothing at all of her great misery? Yet if ye will but stay whom I accost, and listen to my words a little space, at going ye shall mourn with a loud voice. It is her, Beatrice, that she hath lost, of whom the least word spoken holds such grace, that men weep hearing it, and have no choice. A while after these things two gentle ladies sent unto me, praying that I would bestow upon them certain of these my rhymes, and I, taking into account their worthiness and consideration, resolved that I would write also a new thing, and send it to them together with the others, to the end that their wishes might be more honorably fulfilled. Therefore I made a sonnet which narrates my condition, and which I caused to be conveyed to them, accompanied by the one preceding, and with that other which begins, Stay now with me, and listen to my sighs. And the new sonnet is, Beyond the Sphere. This sonnet comprises five parts. In the first I tell whither my thought goeth, naming the place by the name of one of its effects. In the second I say wherefore it goeth up, and who make it go thus. In the third I tell what it saw, namely a lady honored, and then I call it a pilgrim spirit, because it goes up spiritually, and like a pilgrim who is out of his known country. In the fourth I say how the spirit sees her such, that is, in such quality, that I cannot understand her. That is to say, my thought rises into the quality of her in a degree that my intellect cannot comprehend, seeing that our intellect is, towards those blessed souls, like our eye weak against the sun. And this the philosopher says in the second of the metaphysics. In the fifth I say that, although I cannot see there whither my thought carries me, that is, to her admirable essence, I at least understand this, namely, that it is a thought of my lady, because I often hear her name therein. And at the end of the fifth part I say, Ladies mine, to show that they are ladies to whom I speak. The second part begins, a new perception, the third, when it hath reached, the fourth, it sees her such, the fifth, and yet I know. It might be divided more nicely, and made yet clearer, but this division may pass, and therefore I stay not to divide it further. Beyond the sphere which spreads to widest space, now soars the sigh that my heart sends above, a new perception born of grieving love, guideth it upwards the untrodden ways. When it hath reached unto the end, and stays, it sees a lady round whom splendors move, in homage, till, by the great light thereof, abashed, the pilgrim spirit stands at gaze. It sees her such, that when it tells me this, which it hath seen, I understand it not. It hath a speech so subtle and so fine. And yet I know its voice within my thought, often remembereth me of Beatrice, so that I understand it, ladies mine. After writing this sonnet, it was given unto me to behold a very wonderful vision, wherein I saw things which determined me that I would say nothing further of this most blessed one, until such time as I could discourse more worthily concerning her. And to this end I labor all I can, as she well knoweth. Wherefore, if it be his pleasure through whom is the life of all things, that my life continue with me a few years, it is my hope that I shall yet write concerning her what hath not before been written of any woman. After the which, may it seem good unto him who is the master of grace, that my spirit should go hence to behold the glory of its lady, to wit, of that blessed Beatrice, who now gazeth continually on his countenance, qui est per omnia secula benedictus. Laus Deo. End of section 11. End of The New Life, La Vita Nuova, by Dante Alighieri. Translated by Dante Gabriel Rossetti.